for joining us again on Ask Her About. I'm your host, Pranay J. Reddy. And your first question is, why am I buying the same shirt? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's because this is a two-part episode and this is the second part of the two-part episode of the Cosmology series. And today, we're going to talk about how the universe is, why it is the way it is, and all the matter that components the make up the universe as of right now. So if you want to take a look at the previous episode where we talk about how the US began, the link is down below. And yes, the person I'm interviewing today is the same person, Dr. Raghavan Rangarajan, or as I come to know him throughout the interview as Raghu sir. So please, I'm going to take you directly to the interview right now. Take a look. All right, sir. So until now, we talked about how the universe was, how it got to the place it is right now, based on observations we make right now, and how the universe began and everything. But I want to focus on right now, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, in terms of how the universe is built or rather composed of material and energy right now. So correct me if I'm wrong here. It's basically made up of three main components, dark energy, dark matter, and normal matter or baryonic matter. Right. Yes. So I want, I want to understand uh, how do these three interact with each other as of now? So as of now, they maybe they only interact gravitationally. Uh, so, the, um, in nature, in physics, we talk of four forces, gravity, uh, electromagnetic theory, electromagnetic forces, uh, weak forces, and strong forces. Um, strong forces are what keep um, particles, uh, quarks together in a, nuclear, in a, in a proton or a neutron. Um, um, the weak forces are responsible for beta decay and radioactivity. Um, the electromagnetic forces are responsible for electricity, magnetic, electric forces, magnetic forces, and we know about gravity. Now, um, not all particles interact using all of these forces. For example, uh, any particle that is um, electrically neutral, like a neutrino or a neutron, has no electromagnetic interactions. Um, the, now, but all uh, particles will interact gravitationally. It's a, some kind of a universal force. Um, the, today, the dark matter interacts very, very, very weakly, in fact, hardly at all, with uh, uh, neutral matter, with uh, baryonic matter. Baryonic matter is composed of the protons and the neutrons. They're called baryons, so we call it baryonic matter. You can also throw in the electrons. Technically, they're not baryons, but you know that the number of protons that are in the universe will equal the number of electrons, so that the universe... Uh, is electrically neutral. Um, so uh, that's the stuff that you and I are made up of. Okay? And, much of. and all the stuff that we see is basically made up of baryonic matter, which makes up about 5% of the universe, a little less than that. Um, the dark matter makes up about uh, 23% uh, of the universe. And uh, that is, we have known about dark matter since the 1930s. But what is the particle that makes it up? We still don't know. There are all kinds of nice names for them. Uh, machos, wimps, axions. Wait a minute, these uh, are real names? These are real ideas. Oh, Many okay. of them, yeah. Macho stands for massive compact halo objects. Wimps okay. stands for weakly interacting massive particles, uh, which includes we talked of supersymmetry earlier. The lightest supersymmetric particle will not okay. decay further and may possibly not have very many interactions. And it could be the dark matter part. See, the, 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 why do we call it dark matter? We call it dark matter because it, um, or let me, uh, the, in contrast to that is luminous matter. Stuff that either emits light or reflects light. See, you can see something today because either if it emits light, like the sun, or it reflects light, like the moon, or a tube light gives out light, you can see it. We can see each other because the light of the tube light reflects off our bodies. So it should either emit or reflect light. Dark matter is made up of particles that do neither. And therefore you can't see them. So there's dark matter in this room, you can't see it. If, if I move my hand like this, it would be moving through the dark matter. It doesn't interact with my hand, so we don't, we're not able to detect it. Um, so 
this dark matter, when you ask how does it interact with other matter, it really doesn't because the interaction of dark matter with this other matter is so, so weak that we're not able to detect it. There will be gravitational interactions, but gravitational interactions are also weak, which is why, uh, but still, you can see those effects. So we have been able to, by looking at the gravitational effects of dark matter, we have been able to discover, discover them first in clusters of galaxies and then within galaxies. But to know what is the particle making it up, it would be, it would really help if that particle would interact with our detector. But it goes through our detectors. So the detector is made up of you know, this, what you call normal matter or baryonic matter. And this particle this chooses not to interact with this. So it goes right through. So therefore, it is, um, uh, it's just a very, it, it interacts very weakly. Dark energy is a completely different kettle of fish. We have absolutely, very little idea what it is. It was discovered in about 1998 that our universe is not just expanding, but is also accelerating while it's expanding. The only other phase when that happened, and that too was for a very, very, very brief period, was during inflation that we talked about. Earlier. Remember at that point I said, not only is the universe expanding, but you know, it's also accelerating. The rate of expansion uh, is change, the, the rate at which the rate of expansion is changing is also positive. Okay, so you're speeding up and the rate, uh, I mean, you're, the distances are increasing and the rate at which the distance is increasing is also increasing. Okay, so um, uh, the, uh, okay, so, um, in fact, let me just correct myself on that. Um, It's not so much that it is increasing, the rate is not, rate of increase is not increasing, but the rate of increase is positive. That's the correct statement. Okay. Okay. So for the most part of the history of the universe, the universe was expanding, that means distances are increasing. Okay, so there's a, if you want a speed associated with particles moving away from each other, but that speed was decreasing with time. Okay. So it's a decelerating universe. If you're going in a car, you could be going forward with a positive speed, but if you're slowing down, things are decelerating. During inflation and during the current phase, the universe is expanding, distances are increasing, but you're not slowing down, you're speeding up. Uh, this, what is causing it? It could either be that you take Einstein's equation and you add an additional term there, which is called the cosmological constant, that changes the way the universe evolves and that uh, could cause the acceleration. Or, like I said, during inflation, there's some field out there in the universe which evolves in a certain way, has certain properties, and provides a certain energy density that causes the universe to not only expand, but also accelerate while it's expanding, meaning that distances are increasing, but the speed at which the, the, but the speed with which particles are moving away from each other is also increasing. That field during inflation was called the inflaton field just for want of a better name. The field that could be driving the expansion of the universe today is called uh, the quintessence field. And whether it's the cosmological constant or it's the quintessence field, we don't know which it is. And we just use a term uh, to represent either of them, and that's called dark energy. So, okay. Okay, so the energy density associated with the quintessence field or the quote-unquote equivalent energy density associated with the cosmological constant uh, would be called dark energy. And that uh, makes up 70% of the universe today, or about 72%. Yeah, so that, that is what I was getting to because uh, how can we not know what it is if, if it's, that's the major component of the universe today? It's not even before or after. It's today that's the major yeah. component of the universe. And for me, from what little I understand about physics, uh, photons are energy carriers, like they're packets of energy, if I'm not mistaken. And photons Isn't are... Everything? You are an energy carrier. There's an energy associated with your mass. Yes, exactly. And why doesn't yeah. that apply to dark energy is what I'm uh, trying to get to. No. First of all, anything and everything carries energy. Uh, photons today make up a negligible amount of the energy of the universe, or energy density of the universe. Uh, in any finite region today. If we ignore the dark energy, it is dark matter that has most of the energy density. 
uh, uh, baryonic matter has some part of it. And things like photons and neutrinos have negligible part of it. Okay. Now, dark energy, if it is, it's unlikely to be associated with particles because particles have certain properties and they would not give rise to an accelerating universe. So like dark matter, we, we don't know what it is. It doesn't interact very strongly with anything else uh, other than gravitationally. So it's very hard to detect. Um, but uh, it, yeah, but we, we just, we experiments are on to try and discover what might be the, what might underlie dark energy. But as of now, at any given point in time, we generally know so much and there's always this much to learn. Yeah, that is always true, I guess, as uh, scientists or people who are in the research, we always think there's much to learn, but we, we learn bit by bit, you know, that of that yeah. big piece of, uh, 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 let's say, a sugar cube as a hand, we bite of one piece, one piece, and finally some of we figure we'll get to the end part eventually. But uh, yeah. speaking about dark and so we can associate dark energy with the acceleration or rather the expansion of the universe. Am I correct in saying that? We associate dark energy with the acceleration of the expanding universe. Okay, and so then dark matter, uh, I don't know if this or not, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it slows down the uh, yeah. expansion. So how, what is the connection between that, and if we can? Okay, so how you influence the evolution of the universe depends on your properties. It depends, first of all, on how much energy density you have. Okay, that determines the rate of expansion. Also, what is what we call the equation of state, or loosely speaking, or not loosely speaking, but what is the nature of the pressure associated with with, with that species? So, um, um, for when you when you have relativistic particles, they have a pressure that is about one third of their energy density, and that plays a vital role. So it, it, it's significant. So it, when you enter it into Einstein's equation and you try to understand how will the how will distances between two points evolve, this pressure is important. If you have dark matter, uh, then its pressure is very low compared to its energy density. And so the way the universe evolves, if you have a universe filled with non-relativistic particles, which in cosmology is called matter, or uh, is different from the early universe when the universe is filled up with relativistic particles. Um, and uh, so, so there's a difference. Dark energy, its nature of pressure is very, very odd. It, um, if you postulate something called dark energy, the pressure equivalent will turns out to be negative, whatever that means. Okay, so we're not used to concepts like negative pressure, but the pressure associated with the substance that is responsible for dark energy is negative. So its effects are very different from the effects of dark matter. I mean, the only thing in common between the two of them is dark, okay? Is the term dark there, which is both the fact that it, we can't see it and also hides our ignorance about what it is. Also represents our ignorance about what it is. Okay. okay. Well, that... <laughs> That's actually part of the way for it. It you know shows that ignorance or that hides it. But I guess it's one way to look at it. And you're the expert. I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, it is because of the lack of electromagnetic interactions. But um, yeah, yeah so, um, we're, we're in the dark about them. Okay. So that also begs the question. I wanted to know this. Or other, this may be just a goofy question, but I wanted to ask this as well. Can dark matter give us superpowers? Is that possible at all? Not really. Um, see, dark matter is not a very different kind of stuff. Okay. It's made up of some particles. It's just that those particles don't interact with my body or my hand. They don't have any super, they don't have any special characteristics. It's, for example, at one point, uh, neutrinos were postulated as dark matter particles. Okay. Neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactions. They're produced in the sun. There are, you know, a stream of neutrinos coming out of the sun, going through my body at any given instant, your, in, your body as well. They go right through the earth. And um, they don't interact with light. 
So if there are a lot of neutrinos there in our galaxy, then it could be the dark matter. So they're not special. The only thing is that we can't see it. Or we are unable to detect it. But there's nothing special about humans. Well, if there's one thing I learned from this interview of most is that I need to stop watching, you know, uh, sci-fi shows or movies because they corrupted my mind of what things can do to us. <laughs> but um, moving towards uh, matter, normal matter and antimatter, mm -hmm. uh, that's a different equation altogether from dark matter and all of this stuff. Yes, right? yes. So, that's still part of normal matter, I mean, or what we call baryonic matter. Right. So what I came across is this matter antimatter symmetry, asymmetry rather. Asymmetry. And I thought always matter and antimatter should be equal. Uh, so uh, no. Okay. So yeah, you there's a principle in physics which is um, nature loves symmetry. Okay? okay. So you would think that nature would not prefer this over that. In real life, it does. But as a guiding principle, we often say that um, uh, there's you know, nature has no preference for this or that. So then if you notice a difference, then you need to have some explanation of why that might have happened. So actually what we believe that, um, uh, so first of all, let me say what is antimatter. Something I have an electron, an electron has a certain charge, minus 1.6 to 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It has a certain mass. An anti-electron will have just the opposite charge. If it is minus 1.6 into 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for an electron, this, the anti-electron will have plus 1.6 into 10 to the minus 19. But many other properties will be identical. The mass of the anti-electron is the same as the mass of the electron. The anti-electron has a specific name. It's called the positron. Yeah. Okay, and it was just uh, discovered in the first half of the 20th century, 1920s and 1930s. Um, and um, so they've been, I mean, been known and studied them for a long sorry, time. Sorry, how, how can we? How do you discover antimatter? If I may, they usually you'll see them in cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are energetic particles released, let's say, by the explosion of a star in our galaxy. Okay. These come into our atmosphere. They interact with the molecules in our atmosphere, and some reactions happen, and you can produce antiparticles in that. We also produce them in our laboratories. Uh, like the Large Hadron Collider and things like that. In large colliders, one, um, you know, you accelerate particles, collide them, you'll produce a lot of antiparticles as well. But then, why don't you just see them all the time? The point is that once an antiparticle meets its uh, corresponding particle, so if an anti-electron meets an electron, then they tend to annihilate and produce electromagnetic radiation, photons. So that's why... Since there's a lot of matter around, if you produce an anti-matter anti particle, it generally finds some other particle and annihilates. So that's why you don't see it. Okay. So that's, the, that's what antimatter is. It's just like normal matter, except it has just the opposite charges. Now, we believe that in the very early universe, you had an equal amount of matter and antimatter. But, at some, but if you look around the world today, you will see that it's made up entirely of matter. For example, we all are made up of matter. The, the moon is made up of matter. In fact, they famously uh, joke that if the moon was made of antimatter, then when the astronauts went to the moon, then the first step for mankind would have been the last step for mankind because they would have annihilated it. Yeah. So, um, uh, it, so, and we know we've sent probes to different planets. We've also got signals from, different, from galaxies, etc., which all indicates that as far as we can see and as far as we can tell, all the stuff around us is made up only of matter. Now, if that's the case, if, most of the, if the universe is basically made up of matter, the question is that you start off with equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and today you have only matter. So where did this stuff go? What we now believe, but, and there are many ideas and models here, we don't conclusively, no one can say what happened. That, let's say you started off with 100 matter particles and 100 antimatter particles. Due to some disequilibrium in the universe, this could have become 101 matter particles and 99 uh, uh, antimatter particles. Then these antimatter particles were annihilated by the matter particles, and all the stuff, or the little stuff that was left behind, uh, the debris of that uh, annihilation, uh, is what makes up. Uh, the stars and the galaxies and you and me. So you started off with equal, it became unequal, there's an annihilation, 
And whatever little matter remained makes up the universe today. And that's why, and that's an explanation of the matter and antimatter asymmetry. The asymmetry is that you only have matter and not you both matter and antimatter. So uh, let me see if I get this right. So since there's a shift in matter and antimatter, even if it's just one particle, the rest yeah. of them are each other, that debris caused whatever it is we're seeing today. But yeah. this uh, is a question I want to ask. When you say annihilation, a huge amount of energy is released, obviously. But what happens to the particle? Then? It disappears. It disappears. Electron and anti-electron come together. They disappear. Okay. And you produce electromagnetic radiation. You might say, what happened to that particle? So what was that particle? That particle was something with mass. It was something with energy. It was something with spin. Um, all of those will get conserved. Remember, for after E equals mc squared, mass is just another form of energy. We are used to kinetic energy getting converted to potential energy. So here, mass energy just got converted into the kinetic energy for the photons that were produced. All right. So annihilation literally means disappearing into nothing but pure energy. Okay. That's a different definition for annihilation. I don't know what is pure energy because everything is energy. <laughs> okay. All right. Mass is a form of energy. So an inanimate stone sitting somewhere is energy because it has E equals mc squared. Right. So, uh, and it may go into particles that may or may not be I mean, purely relativistic or uh, photons don't have mass. But yeah. an annihilation can also give rise to some particles that have mass. There's no, it doesn't always so, have to go into. So I just had one clarification in the sense like, so the shift from 900 to 99101 or 100. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, hypothesis or theory why that did happen due to some fields maybe? Okay, so there are multiple models. Incidentally, these are called baryogenesis uh, models. Uh, yeah. We're mainly talking as I, of normal matter. We're talking of normal matter here, which is protons, neutrons, electrons. Um, and protons and neutrons are much heavier than electrons. So in terms of energy density, it's basically the baryons that one often is talking about. And, um, and so therefore, one talks in terms of baryogenesis. But it, at the same time, it also produces electrons over anti-electrons. Um, um, okay, so one idea that people have worked on is that, let's say you have some particle, let me call it X. X can decay to baryons, and it can also decay to antibaryons. Okay, but the rate at which it decays to baryons is more than the rate at which it decays to antibaryons. So in a certain, if you start off with 100 X particles, the rate at which it goes to baryons is faster than the rate at which it goes into antibaryons. And therefore, when it finally decays, it ends up creating more baryons than antibaryons. Okay. If the rates are different, that means it prefers one over the other. Now, why would it prefer one over the other? There's a notion in physics called uh, charge and parity violation. You might think that, um, uh, it should have the same rate going into baryons or antibaryons. But if you have something, some, if those reactions violate something called uh, C or charge conservation, is, electric charge is conserved, but certain other things may be getting, charge conjugation actually, is charge conjugation is getting violated. Um, then the rate to go into particle may be different from the rate to go into antibody. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. So exactly. see, it, it, those reactions somehow prefer one or the other. Not all reactions do. Many right. reactions give you the same amount of baryons and antibaryons. So there are certain kinds of reactions which violate what we call charge conjugation symmetry. Uh, then they can give more of particle than antibody. So if I can sum, sum it up, this the composition or rather how our universe is right now. And how do you think that would shift because we've seen it's different at the beginning and right now it's yeah. a different competition. How do you think that will shift going into the future? Let's say maybe another 10 million years. Okay. So, um, um, but if we don't, million years and 10, I hope you said 10 billion years because 10 million years is a very yeah, short. Let's make, let's make a 10 billion years. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, to honestly answer that question, I would need to know the details of the present. Because if I know the present, I can evolve in the future. I don't have enough information about dark energy to tell you what's going to happen in the future. 
Okay. If, um, I mean, if the field that's responsible for dark energy decays all of a sudden, then it disappears and we will no longer be accelerating. Uh, we'll go back to being maybe like a dark matter dominated universe. One doesn't know. So therefore, uh, one can only speculate about what's happening in, going to happen in the future. If dark energy domination continues, then over a period of time, if today dark energy is about 72% of the energy density of the universe and dark matter is about 23%, baryonic matter is five, if the domination of dark energy continues, then it, this 72 is going to keep increasing. Okay. Um, because, so it, uh, ultimately you can be completely dark energy. I mean, 72 is already high. It will just keep growing more and more. If that happens, um, yeah, so the, what will happen to galaxies and things like that? There are different ideas. There are some in which the galaxies will now begin to move away from each other very fast. Um, the stars in them will finally uh, burn out of their fuel and the galaxies will become very dark and, um, you know, and that's what you know, happens to us. And um, there are other ideas in which even the galaxies will now start splitting up and um, the gas inside. And so the stars will burn out and then the galaxies will split up or expand out and we'll have a very, very dilute gas throughout the universe. These will be on tens of billions of years, trillion years kind of time frame. So it's all predicated on us knowing or rather better understanding uh, uh, dark energy, not see how or what can happen. And so we don't need to worry too much because um, in another five, six billion years, anyway, the solar system is history. So, you know, not a problem for us, you know. <laughs> well, uh, based on like so honestly, the sun is going to get very hot and, yeah. and it, uh, it goes through new phases called red giant. As it gets hotter, the, all the temperature on the earth will rise, water will evaporate, they're finished, and you know, life will disappear. Of course, humankind may destroy this planet long before nature chooses to do so. Yeah, that was what I was gonna come to <laughs> actually. But uh, maybe some one last question I want to ask you is this is nothing to do with uh, the universe. Or I just want to ask as a physicist. See, like you rightly said, uh, you make observations right now. You see these observations and then you make predictions on how the universe was or what will be. But uh, let's just take the Big Bang theory, for example. So did, do, do physicists have a concept of that theory and then write uh, formulas or rather make uh, predictions to make, prove them right or rather just go based on their formulas, go based on their math and physics to see what is going to happen or what did happen? So there's usually an interplay between observations and uh, um, uh, so, uh, creating of theories. Um, so sometimes there's some observation that looks very odd. So a scientist will say, hmm, uh, maybe it, it's odd because it doesn't agree with our current ideas and our current models. So let me propose a new theory. It may not be a whole grand theory. It could even be a small subset within a larger theory. And say this, this, this. Now that explains what we're seeing, but that's not interesting. It must also make a prediction about what else could be there. You know, some, so then the experimentalists or the observers go and try to see um, what you have now predicted, does it exist or not? If they find yes, then this theory gets validated and people will then look for other consequences of that theory. If no, then someone else has to propose another theory, which can explain both the observations up to this point. And so this, and then propose some other thing that would be uh, predicted. And so this just goes back and forth uh, as we, and that's how we build our understanding. Interestingly enough, when Einstein gave us his theory of general relativity, he applied it to the universe. And he by the way created that theory, and this is very uh, unusual in physics, almost single-handedly. There were a few other people who, so Marcel Grossman and others who helped him and whom he discussed with, but largely the theory came from him, somewhat unique scientist. Um, he applied his theory of general relativity to understand the universe. And when he did that, uh, he found that the universe would not be static. He recognized from his equations 
that if a universe is made up of matter and etc cetera, etc cetera, it the distances between points will be changing with time that disturbed him you know, I mean, for whatever reason I mean, he felt no that can't be right so he introduces remember i mentioned that cosmological constant that could no. explain the dark energy i said there's that you can modify einstein's equation by adding a cosmological yeah. constant so that's when in 1915 17 18 he throws in a cosmological constant into his theory so that the universe distances would not change with time okay and then hubble and humason make a discovery that the universe is actually expanding the distances between distant galaxies is increasing and uh, einstein says this was a huge blunder on my part okay so he removes the cosmological constant from his theory and the understanding is so people now so he made a he made a theory he applied it to his universe to the universe then um observations proved that understanding in the, that wrong so that theory had to be tweaked changed now with this new theory without this cosmological constant people make bunch of predictions that then told us that the universe would be very hot in the early universe that's why it's called the hot big bang model by the way so very hot in the early universe um it would be expanding would be expanding faster in the early universe compared to now all of that had certain um based on that you could make some theoretical conclusions like for example 75% of the universe would be hydrogen or 25% would be helium the observers then went and said hey you know what we are actually seeing about 75% is hydrogen 25% is helium then you know that okay something is right there may be some other predictions that aren't quite working then you know that there are still some lacuna in your theory so this is how it it continues and the cosmological constant incidentally was brought back later on in okay. early, uh, you know in the, after the discovery of dark energy that, that acceleration of the universe that maybe einstein was right all along but in a different context that is you know it's now explaining the expansion of the universe um, or acceleration of the universe he introduced it because he wanted to prevent he wanted to keep the universe static it's a way in which you introduce it into the equation that's slightly different so that's a technical point but the 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 cosmological constant plays a certain role he used it to explain something which didn't agree with the observations today we use it to explain some other observations so it genuinely is a combination of like okay let's go with the theory we have we we'll see if it goes to that or rather based on some other findings or observations we find to it accordingly all right that's yeah. that's great actually that's really is because as a person who doesn't who loves physics but who doesn't necessarily work in it day to day that's always something i wanted to know and i'm pretty sure everybody would love to know that when uh, once again sir I guess that's the end of the interview. I asked almost all the questions, and thank you, thank you so much for doing this with us, Sis. It's been a pleasure to interview you so far. Yeah, thanks a lot. I've enjoyed this a lot too. Oh, that's that's great. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you.